Welcome to my talk on assisted natural regeneration for semi-arid and arid lands. My name is David Bainbridge and I've been a restoration ecologist for more than 30 years in the deserts and dry lands of North America. The challenge of these dry lands is the fact that they look tough but they're very fragile, easily damaged, and hard to repair. This flat plain in Chihuahua, Mexico shows the long-term effects of overgrazing. To understand the history of a site, we'd like to know why things happened, how they happened, when, and what the current conditions are. To guide natural regeneration, we need to understand the causal chain of economic and cultural factors that led to the damage or destruction. These may be family issues, community issues, national issues, and often involve global politics and economics. The question is, how can these be mitigated with policy or education? Climate change brings a whole new range of challenges. Greater heat, more severe drought, and more severe storms with heavy downpours that can really tear dry lands apart. Resource limitations are usually severe in these areas with very little money for work, uh, very few supplies, and limited options for even research on the functions. But people are available and they can do many things with the available resources, labor, and a commitment to change. The key step is to focus on the site and understand as much as possible what the functions are in the area. Traditionally much restoration has looked at historic structure. What species were there, what plants, what were the distributions, and many cases of planted nursery grown plants at great cost and sadly limited success. For assisted natural regeneration we want to consider ecosystem function, particularly the water flow on, over, and through a site. We also take a close look at changes in soil properties uh, from the undisturbed conditions, if we can find them, to the conditions today. In the picture, we see a training session we did at Red Rock Canyon State Park. This is a little portable infiltrometer that we developed to better understand how water flows into the soil at this particular site. Every drop of water counts, and one of the key steps is catching whatever you can. Here we have a picture of hand pitted area with a straw waddle included to reduce erosion risk of gullying. Uh, Zy pits had traditionally used in the Western Sahel and popularized in Burkina Faso and uh, imprinting an area in the Mojave Desert that had been completely denuded of plants. So you can choose the size of water catchment based on the types of rainfall you have and the type of soil and your ultimate goals. One of the low cost options is the Kim Seed Camel Pitter, so called because it could be pulled behind a camel. It's effective, it's relatively low cost, it's usually pulled with a 4x4 vehicle, and it has seed boxes on the back which can be set up to drop native seeds or introduce seeds into the pitted areas to grow plants. And you can see what kind of success is possible under the rainfall conditions that might be encountered. Even more interesting uh, challenges with areas with very high water flows here on the Rio Bavispe in Sonora, Mexico, a very small stream in the summer, but it can be huge during floods. And the traditional practice here has been to line the waterway with pole planted check dams and weirs. The large flood flows that occur are spread over the fields using brush weirs, and the field edges are protected with pole planted populous and salix trees, really making it a most impenetrable barrier. This holds water onto the site so it can seep into the soil, recharge the groundwater, and provide water for farming. Equally, it could be done to retain water for revegetation or assisted natural regeneration. At a smaller scale, we can catch water with a rainwater harvesting membrane this one was set up in Anza Borrego Desert State Park for water at a very remote site, difficult to get to even with a four-wheel drive vehicle, and it proved capable of capturing rainfall with even less than one millimeter of rain. 
provided critical irrigation water at this remote site at a relatively good cost. To really understand rainwater harvesting, it's worth a trip to the literature about Nabatea, or better yet, a field trip to Nabatea in Jordan and Israel. No one has ever done a better job at capturing rainwater. Here I'm sitting at a cistern carved in sandstone. The cistern itself is a fairly large container underneath there, and it was once plastered to help retain water so the water didn't seep into the sandstone. Small channels going out from here collected the rainwater, brought it into the little basin you see for the sediment to drop out, and then trickled into the catchment and into the cistern itself. There are hundreds of cisterns and water collection and management devices at Petra, definitely worth a two or day, three day field trip if you can manage it. Some of the most remarkable projects are these slot dams and you can see two dams in this picture going up this fairly steep slope. I provide scale and in the little arrow with the cistern is a fairly large pool or what would have once been a pool uh, full of water. Today it's full of sediment and has a tree that's very happily growing there with a rainwater collection system all its own. These dams are not inexpensive to build, but they're simple local materials and they could provide irrigation water to use for regeneration, planting for things like resource islands or for food for local people. In Mexico, often the brush weirs are not all the way across the watershed or across the channel, but are used to divert water into the farm fields. They'll wash out many times, but they're easily replaced and they provide a valuable source of water for the farmers. On the right, we have the Mojave Desert, a much simpler check dam that was built in an erosion gully already full of sediment and the added water it captures is helping plants to grow. We can also apply some of the things used in farm fields to catch water. Here we have brush weirs used uh, in Bangladesh as well as half moon collectors, a little uh, micro catchment basin for trees. The Tohono O'odham people of the Sonoran Desert used low brush fences like this to slow water flow across the fields, improve infiltration of water, and it also captured nutrient-rich debris. In some cases, beaver can be put to use to build dams. In many semi-arid and arid areas of the North America, we had beaver at one time, and they're gradually being reconsidered as an option for controlling erosion and storing water. Idaho rancher Jay Wild released just nine beaver on this watershed, and they built 175 dams in just five years. This would have cost thousands of dollars to do with equipment and people. In some cases, beaver dam analogs need to be built to capture enough water to grow enough riparian plants for the beaver to survive. And here we have a picture of beaver being parachuted in for stream restoration in Idaho. This was done also in California. The beaver boxes would open up when they hit the ground and the somewhat bemused beavers would waddle out and head for the nearest stream. They're really good hard workers and they don't cost anything. We don't think of beaver dams in the desert, but here's an example from uh, northern Nevada where a series of beaver dams run up this little draw. There are no traditional trees here that the beaver would eat, but they can survive on a number of shrubs and also aquatic plants. They really make a big difference in retaining water in ecosystems. They can recharge the groundwater over a fairly large area with their spreading dams and canals, and they can extend seasonal flows, places that once were dry in the summer suddenly have water. And they also enhance biodiversity by providing water, riparian vegetation, and a very more diverse habitat for a variety of species. Sometimes all we can do is protect natural seedlings. And after an ecologically significant rainfall, which may occur just every five or 10 years, we may see a number of seedlings sprout 
And one of the best things you can do is protect the ones that sprout by themselves with a cage, with rocks, thorny branches, or tree shelters. The rock protection also provides plants protection from sandblasting, which can be a real issue for plants in denuded, uh, degraded areas, and provides some mitigation of extreme temperatures. You can see in the rock picture there, all the branches have been chewed off down to the level of the rocks. Uh, cages are expensive, and if a plant grows into the cage, it becomes a challenge getting the cage off the plant. Uh, we did had to do quite a few cageectomies on this particular project. And you can use natural materials for protection, as we see in this picture from uh, Portugal. Although we don't often get a chance for low, low cost to collect seed and spread it, it's worthwhile if you can do it. And if you collect the site nearby on similar exposures and elevations, you can make use of locally adapted plants. The seed has to be collected, cleaned, stored, and then ideally respread just before or as it starts to rain so it's not all eaten or blown away. One option is to create what's called a resource island, and this is an area within a site that gets a fence, irrigation of some kind, and either seeded and or container plants to provide a local source of seeds and uh, microsymbionts of all kinds for the site. These can create a local seed source that seeds the site year after year and would gradually fill in the denuded areas. And once again, protection could be built with thorny branches instead of a wire fence. And where possible, supplemental irrigation can make a big difference in getting things started. Seed collection is really uh, a low cost and often valuable part of natural regeneration. The key is to collect mature seeds that's fully ripe, to collect it and clean it, get all the bugs out so it's not eaten while you're storing it, and to store it under the best possible conditions. As my wife reminds me, this is not a paper bag under my desk. Uh, understanding seed dormancy is critical and seeds may have to be treated so they have a better chance to, uh, to sprout. Some of the hard seeded plants can be scarified uh, with uh, sandpaper or a chipper or even just a knife to make a slit so water can get in and get the seed started. In the picture I'm collecting Indian rice grass from an uh, area of the Mojave Desert. And one of the issues in many ecosystems is what natural management or human management did years ago in terms of spreading plants that were particularly useful for humans. In areas where floods are common, a flood seeder can be made that releases seeds during the flood event. So in this example, we've got a branch that's laid down in the channel. Uh, when the flood comes, it pulls the uh, log down the stream and the log pulls the plug out of a seed container and the seed sifts down into the water and is spread out as the water goes further downfield. This gets seeds at the most advantageous times. What we would like to see is rain, but rain may not come except every two or three years or even further apart. So supplemental irrigation may be needed to keep our natural seedlings alive, or if we try to grow container plants, to keep container plants alive. And there are a wide number of super efficient irrigation systems that can be used. You can see many of my other papers and books about super efficient irrigation, deep pipes, wicks, oyas, clay pots, leaky pipes, and other options for very low water use. Many of these plants would only get a few gallons a year, but it's enough to keep them alive not growing, mind you, but alive until it finally rains. One of the low-cost options combines seeding into basins as a way to get water and seeds in the same place to spread the seed carefully and lightly cover it so it doesn't blow away. If possible, to put out several species before the most likely rainfall. If you have a variety of species, the chances of hitting conditions that are good for one are better. If possible, we would add mulch. If possible, we would add some organic matter and we would be prepared to detect the seedlings that come up. 
This picture is for uh, an area of Anzabrego Desert State Park again that had been totally denuded by vehicle operation and it's been pitted and seeded and it has uh, mulch added and it was very successful. In many cases, an area that's totally denuded and looks hopeless is really just a problem of continuing abuse. Here we have an example from India. The trees in the distance grew by themselves once a fence was erected. The planned research center was never built, but the fence was maintained, and you can see the difference in and outside the fence. Inside the fence, trees grew, shrubs of all kinds, grasses, flowers, it was truly remarkable. Outside the fence, the most appalling weeds that even the goats didn't want to eat. One of the things that can be helpful is developing a grazing management plan that provides protection for plants in the ecosystem. And this can be done by uh, rotational grazing, mixed species grazing, uh, using confined livestock instead of open grazing. Uh, protection of riparian areas or parts of riparian areas can be critical. And protection of selected plots will provide uh, a better understanding of what the grazing effects are. Some of our projects we used uh, exclosures and enclosures to look at the effects of grazing. And we were surprised to see how big an impact rabbits were having in this particular area. Uh, the Osmanbadi goats of Karnataka uh, are dryland adapted goats. And in the study, they found that the farmers could make more by stall feeding than by grazing. And this makes a big difference on impacts on the environment. The biggest resource of these dry lands is the people and putting them to use, helping them understand what can and can't be done and what might be helpful can be very important. They may have limited natural resources, but many times they're willing to work hard, they learn quickly what helps, and they'll follow up with it over the years. With appropriate support for assisted regeneration, they can improve their income and their quality of life. Farmers in Niger have shown what can be done. The study showed that they were spending only $14 per hectare per year to improve their management, and it restored over 6 million hectares in 40 years. The key to this was farmer-to-farmer -farmer information transfer, and this is a critical issue in any efforts at better natural resource management. Experts and white shirts often have a difficult time connecting with farmers despite their best intentions. <coughs> Demonstration sites can offer a farmer a guaranteed income while testing new crops, grazing, irrigation, soil preparation, fences, and feeding systems. And the Carter Foundation is one of the first to do that. This reduces the risk for innovation, and that can be a big block if your entire livelihood depends on success, it's very difficult to encourage someone to try something new. If a foreign expert is included in the project, it can be helpful to have them live on site for months or years, rather than just parachuting in for two weeks in the best time of year. And one example of this is at Al Baida in uh, Saudi Arabia, a very nice project. Natural regeneration can also be assisted by improved home gardens. This can reduce grazing pressure and pressure to cut firewood and sell uh, products from areas that are being damaged. It can also improve the health and quality of life. It can improve the quality of feed for animals. And one of the best things to consider are agroforestry options for food for people and animals. Uh, Multi-purpose tree crops can make a big difference in reducing pressure on the grazing lands and areas around settlements. So perhaps an option in the future will be funding coming from the developed countries for carbon sequestration to help areas with limited resources. In the diagram from India, 
and we see buried clay pot or oya irrigation being used to keep a multi-purpose tree cop alive. And in many cases, these systems provide remarkable survival on many of our projects with uh, buried clay pots. We'd have 90% survival and good growth. Assisted regeneration can be effective. Key steps are to capture the water, protect seedlings, collect and place seeds in basins with amendments, to manage grazing better, uh, to improve home gardens, and to encourage long-term projects that are difficult otherwise to consider. Here we have an example of what can be done with simple techniques. The area above was pitted, seeded, and mulched in 1995. In three years, you can see there's a shrub in almost every basin that was made, and they've held up very well over time. For resources, and this is just a very beginning introduction to the challenging problem of natural regeneration of arid and semi-arid lands, take a look at my book, A Guide for Desert and Dryland Restoration, uh, my more recent one, Gardening with Less Water, which explores these super efficient irrigation systems in detail. Uh, the restoration of arid and semi-arid lands in Van Andel and Arison's book on restoration ecology and a paper I did on carbon sequestration with mesquite. This is a multi-purpose tree in an agroforestry setting. Uh, the other papers are also worth a good look. And one of the options is monetizing environmental services. So the two books are Gardening with Less Water. And this was inspired by a book from China describing this technique more than 2,000 years ago. And when I took it out to the garden at the University of California at Riverside, I was just astonished by how well it worked. More than 20 years later, it's still what I consider one of the best low-cost, low-tech <coughs> techniques in the world for irrigation. We found it could reduce water use up to 90% compared to flood irrigation and 50% from drip irrigation. Because the water flows through the clay uh, by capillary action at a very low rate, the plant water use demand effectively becomes the management system for the flow of water. If the plant needs more water, it dries down the soil and the clay, and the water moves from inside to the outside. Very effective. The Guide for Desert and Dryland Restoration, the image there is from one of the larger Native American communities, uh, Chaco Canyon, an area that managed these resources very well for many years to surprise, support a fairly large population. Well, it's been my pleasure to talk to you today and hope this provides some new insight and opportunities for natural regeneration. Thank you very much.